Hello, I'm Fred Bookstein. Most of my career, I've worked on the measurement of biological shape and shape change using landmarks, the discrete, individually named data points that you see in diagrams and textbooks. These points, like bridge of the nose or tip of the chin, are locations that have coordinates in every form of a series of images so that they sample not only the geometry of the scenes one by one, but also the biological correspondence between forms, the biological homology map. Over the last 10 years, methods have been developed for averaging the shapes of landmark configurations, for correlating them with their causes or effects, and for statistical tests of group differences. More recently, we've been exploring ways of visualizing all these kinds of findings about shape change in one consistent graphical language of deformation. With the help of a flexible interpolation, the thin plate spline, any reconfiguration of a set of landmarks can be interpreted as a deformation taking the one set onto the other and as smooth as possible in between. This video introduces a new extension of these techniques to incorporate information about edges at landmarks. The work has all been joint with my colleague William Green, who developed the underlying mathematics with me and who also built the substantial program in C and X windows by which our stellar computer produced every frame of these demonstrations, most of them in real time. Begin with this pair of images of three dots on a grid. The dots will ultimately be landmarks, points we can follow from specimen to specimen. We are interested in variation of the shape of the entire configuration. In this visualization, we represent that variation by movement. As the landmarks move around, they specify a continually changing deformation of the original grid. We can study the landmarks or we can study the grid. It won't matter. For three points, that deformation is affine. It leaves parallel lines parallel. Now this movie could just as well be imagined a series of oblique views of the original square grid, say, the shadow it casts as it tumbles over a plane. This alternative becomes clearer if there are more landmarks. We locate another landmark at lower left and push it upward. Now the right-hand form really looks like a bent sheet in space. If it were, it would be a solution of the biharmonic equation. It has the minimum bending energy of all surfaces through those four points. But this form, too, could be imagined a deformation of the same starting square grid, now driven by four points instead of three. It is easier to accept this mathematical pun, the interplay between the three-dimensional surface and the two-dimensional deformation, for cases less extreme. Here is a deformation of the starting square into a trapezoid of landmarks, or else another view of the same plate. And here is another, into the shape geometers call a kite, two corners of the square moved perpendicular to the diagonal connecting them. Again, this is, at the same time, a projected view of some multiple of the same original thin plate. The surface adopts the form minimizing bending energy. The equivalent deformation is minimizing the same quantity, the integral of summed squared second derivatives, now a measure of the variability of affine derivative across the scene, a quantification of localizable information content. On the other hand, some views make sense only as surfaces, like this side view of the original plate. The thin plate spline, computed by a simple matrix manipulation, supplies an interpolant for any number of landmarks in any pair of configurations. Here, for instance, is a slightly bent surface over five landmarks starting in the form of a quincunx, the five spot of a die. And here is a more vertical view of what might be the same surface, showing how it serves at the same time as the deformation relating to configurations of the same five points. We can proceed similarly to freely warp configurations of six or any number of landmarks from any starting configuration to any other one. Some of these our visual system would rather interpret as surfaces, but surface or warp, they are all minimizing the same quantity. Deformations computed using only point locations can be applied to other objects in their coordinate system. For instance, this red circle, intended to suggest that these four landmarks originate as points on the outline of a biological form. When we deform the grid by reconfiguring the landmarks, the outline follows. If we suppress the grid, we can imagine that we are somehow bending the outline around, but algebraically, that is not what actually happens. The outline just follows passively as the grid is bent. <laughs> 
Additional landmarks interior to the form drag the grid like any other landmark and bend the outline in exactly the same way even though they are not on it. The same grid transformation that carries outlines along can be used to warp whole pictures. Here's part of the mid-sagittal section of a medical student and eight landmark points that will concern us in more detail later. We can grab one of these points at a time with a mouse and drag it around. The splined grid follows. This transformation has expanded the lower part of the frontal lobe and compressed the cerebellum a bit. Conventional resampling methods can unwarp the entire starting picture in accordance with this grid to arrive at this extrapolated mid-sagittal section for the same medical student after she has spent too much time in the library. The techniques so far allow a useful form of image averaging. Here are 10 landmarks placed at what turned out to be the average of 14 individual shapes, one set for each of 14 mid-sagittal images like the exemplar you just saw. We located these landmarks in each of the 14 forms. Here is the configuration for the first student, for instance. And we used them to drive an inverse warp, an unwarping, so to speak, that brings each of the original mid-sagittal scans into the same coordinate system, the average of all 14. This scene, in other words, is what this student's brain would have looked like if it had its own specific gray levels, but precisely the average geometry, as far as these 10 landmarks are concerned. Here is another case, shown as a warping of the standard landmark set, and the unwarping of his specimen image, and so on. After unwarping all 14 individual images, we have a collection of scans all in the same coordinate system. The separate images can be averaged there, resulting in this picture. The regions from which the landmarks were taken are fairly unblurred, of course, but so are some others. The arch of corpus callosum, the curves of pons and ventricles, the line of the chiasm. This impressive result loses a bit of impact if you compare it to another average based on a subset of only four of the preceding ten points, selected by statistical criteria that extract the largest scale features of variability of the full set of ten, and so make for a much smoother unwarping. At left here is the four-point average, at right the ten-point. Although you can tell which is which, for instance, genu of corpus callosum is blurred on the left and not on the right. They are remarkably similar. So the list of landmarks underlying an averaged picture need not make much difference for the quality of the resulting image. But let's read this same equivalence backwards. Augmenting a scene by more and more points may make little difference for the quality of other visual and statistical aspects of the scene, such as the undesirable blurring of edges that afflicts both of these images. To sharpen the precision of this average, and so enhance its usefulness, we need to reach beyond landmarks to more of the original information in the medical image. Let me go back to the beginning, then, and introduce you to a distinct new variety of image warping parameter arising as a limiting case, a singular perturbation of the underlying thin plate spline. Here is a scene of six landmarks, four in the form of a square, unchanging from left to right, and two others near the center that lie horizontally at the left, but shear downward by 45 degrees at the right. The thin plate spline here relaxes that shear outward from the moving segment toward the fixed landmarks in every direction. Indeed, over relaxes a bit. Past the corners of the square, the transformation induced is somewhat opposed to the shear inside, upward rather than downward at the right. We're going to examine a series of scenes in which that central segment becomes shorter and shorter while continuing to shear downward in the right-hand image. And I've moved the left endpoint of that segment to the center of the square. Its length now starts arbitrarily at about 10% of the side of the square. Varying the amount of shear alters the grid by multiples of that slope. Here, we have reduced the length of the segment to 5% of that of the square. At the right, the segment between the dots still slopes downward at 45 degrees, but the resulting grid transformation looks a bit milder than before. For instance, the grid line out to the first intersection now lies distinctly above the interlandmark segment. To reconstruct the deformation at 10%, we need to steepen this one at 5% by a factor that proves to be about 1.3. The shear attenuates more as the segment shortens further. Here's the 45 degree shear of a segment of length 1% of the side of the square. Clearly, it is much weaker at every grid intersection. And here is the equivalent transformation for a 1% segment sheared downward by an angle of tangent 2.
This transformation looks remarkably like that 45 degree shear at segment length one tenth, and the factor of two is the ratio of the logarithms of segment length, a hundredth versus a tenth. And here's the transformation of a segment of length one ten thousandth shearing down by 45 degrees. Of course, you can't see that there are two landmarks. At the finite distance of any grid intersection, close in or far away, there is hardly any effect visible. But if that very short segment is sheared further downward on the right until it has slope four, then again, the transformation is nearly the same as the one that's sheared to slope one at segment length one tenth. And since four is the log of one ten thousandth, we may have found the proper scaling. A careful algebraic workup verifies that the grid transformations induced by shearing segments of steadily shorter length, scaled up by the log of the length, converge quickly to a limiting deformation. Then we can draw our scene using only one landmark, not two, and a new graphical element, an edge element, or edgel, through the landmark. Bending the edgel around generates shears that are all multiples of the same underlying mapping to simulate rotation of the edgel by different angles. The approximation can't go too far. We can't rotate 90 degrees. But for small to moderate variation, such as corresponds to living humans, the linearization here is quite adequate. The scale of an edgel, roughly speaking, is the grid spacing at which the rotation is correct. Here, the original one-tenth. The limiting process we are pursuing is clear as well from the picture of the equivalent physical plate. In 3D, the edgel shear looks like it is twisting the plate by some sort of clamp fixed to its surface at that middle landmark. That impression exactly accords with the algebra of the limiting map back in the plane. We need two landmarks, but they can be as close together as you like. Like the thin plate spline itself, the mathematics of this limit applies to edgels in any orientation. The limit of a pair of landmarks along a diagonal, for instance, is an edgel along that diagonal. As a warping function applied to the grid, it looks different. As a surface, it is not so different. We have imposed the same sort of edge along the diagonal of the starting square that before lay parallel to a pair of sides. The formula for this limiting perturbation has two pieces. One, the same for any starting scene, is essentially the function r log r gradient of the kernel r squared log r of the underlying thin plate spline. But a second term is always present that compensates for the shifts of landmark position induced by the first term, however many other landmarks there are. The adjustment bends the hump of the r log r term more sharply where landmarks are closely spaced and relaxes in a less sharply bent way wherever there is more room. Happily, the same mathematics extends to limits of arbitrary pairs of landmarks at close spacing. The limiting scene is now one of arbitrary shears of edge elements. These usually interact with each other and with reconfigurations of the landmarks themselves in very interesting ways. Change of a configuration of only landmarks may be decomposed into a superposition of partial warps, each an eigenfunction of the bending energy for fixed summed squared landmark displacements. Similarly, Changes in scenes with multiple edgels can be described by their principal edgel warps, which summarize patterns of coordinated rotation of those edgels that are most bent or least bent, or of stationary bending for fixed sum squared rotation of the edgels. For instance, here is a set of seven edgels and one more landmark, and this is the edgel driven warp of greatest specific bending per unit squared rotation. Here are the next few principal edgel warps, progressively smoother and smoother. Here is the second smoothest, and finally, the smoothest principal edgel warp. All have the same summed squared rotation, and all leave the landmarks fixed. As a set, they provide a very useful spectrum of features into which to decompose changes in scenes with edgels. They might serve, for example, to organize spatially distributed fields of flow. Free play with these scenes is one of the great pleasures of our workstation. After a couple of landmarks are moved, for instance, the set of seven edgels we were just looking over can be torqued playfully into this sculpted surface, almost impossible to see as any sort of plane deformation. Like the landmark-driven deformations, deformations of edgels apply to the other information in the picture plane. Here is a scene of four landmarks on a circle with an edgel along the circle at one of them. Twisting that edgel bends the grid around in a way you have already seen. If the grid isn't drawn, the same transformation can be seen as bending the outline 
drawing it inward to one side of the landmark, outward to the other side. The reflection of this transform in the normal to the edgel is more or less its inverse map. For more than one edgel, interplay between the boundary-based description and the grid-based description can be quite interesting. Here's the same circle, now with a pair of edge elements aligned with a square. When the edge elements shear in the same direction, the effect is that of lowering or lifting the center of the grid by a gradient of some r log r shape. The effect on the outline is difficult to put into words. When the edge will shear in opposite directions, by comparison, the effect on the outline is easy to describe. It is the sharpening of the arc at left into a nose or beak. The underlying grid deformation now appears to have induced vertical strain throughout the interior of the circle. The three-dimensional thin plate corresponding to this change is a twist of the left edge of the square. It can also be thought of as opposite r log r gradients along the front edge and the back edge. When edges point at each other as along a diameter of the circle, the grid transformations their rotations induce leave the circle pretty much alone, but lift the center of the grid or twist the diameter. The superposition of two of these diagonal schemes can rotate the interior with respect to the exterior, can place quite an anisotropy up the middle, or can move the interior smoothly toward one corner. Still holding to this square of landmarks, another assortment of shape changes comes when edgels lie tangent to the outline at all four corners. Rotations at adjacent edgels may be concordant or discordant. This form doesn't have a name but the other principal edgel warp produces a sort of trilobite. Rotations at opposed edgels likewise may be concordant or discordant. While one of these forms is nameless, the other is that famous American agricultural advance, the Taco Bell. When the symmetry of the original square is broken, these principal edgel warps ramify into a very interesting series. Let us move one corner of the square, for instance, leaving the edgel tangent to the circle there. Even in this simple scene, there results a rich spectrum of outline shape changes. The most bent principal edgel warp grows an upper lip here at lower left, for instance. Taken with the other sign, it produces a nose. The edgel warp of next sharpest specific bending appears to be sucking in the tummy of this little form. The inverse warp droops outward at both ends. The second most gentle principal edgel warp, here, is a drooping toward the bottom at the bottom right. Its inverse droops instead toward the right at bottom right. Finally, taken with one sign, the edgel warp of least specific bending energy resembles our Taco Bell. Its inverse is the most interesting of all. The shape into which the circle is warped here is that of a cartoon character, the Shmoo, drawn by Al Cap for his daily strip, Lil Abner, popular in the United States at mid-century. Here's the face, front leg, back leg, buttocks. The shmoo is an animal of obscure phylum that gives milk in quarts and lays eggs in cartons and is always eager to immolate itself for the comfort of its human companions. The drawing of this infinitely gentle creature is the gentlest possible outline through its four landmarks. The edge warps don't have to start with circles, of course. Here's a sketch of contours hand-traced from that average mid-sagittal section we saw a few minutes ago, and here are ten landmarks upon it. We can grab the vertex and drag it upward to create acrocephaly. We can grab the frontal lobe and shear it forward to make room for more medical knowledge. With this edgel and three others like it, optic chiasm, brainstem, tentorium, we can do a creditable job of matching contours on all 14 of our mid-sagittal images. How this works is clearest for outlines. The standard template would be placed over the individual scene in some arbitrary way and then Landmark by landmark, manually or automatically, the template is warped onto the case, curve by curve. Once the landmarks are placed, one notices that some anatomical edges don't align. That's what the edges are for. We twist them to arrive at a better overall fit. Of course, at the same time, this is instructions for a deformation of the standard geometry into that of the single case. This applies to raw pictures even better than to outlines. Start with the same averaged contour, but warp it directly onto the grayscale image, matching to image gradients. At the outset, a tentative set of landmarks from the template are located on the patient, 
and we search for matching failures. A warp from seven landmarks grossly misses the vertex. An additional landmark on the bony calvarium greatly improves the fit up there. Only now can we notice that some edges seem not to line up too well. The same sort of playful interaction we have already seen serves to make for a much more satisfactory match of template to image. Here, the leftmost edgel is a free dial corresponding to no particular local information, whereas the other three lie along image edges or image ridges themselves. Then they could in principle be aligned by local operations rather than by a human operator. As always, the matching constitutes a description of the specimen image as a warping of the standard. Again, running the deformation backward brings us to the image we might have seen had this specimen had the average geometry instead of its own. But now, that unwarping specifies not only eight points, but also four edgels. We may proceed to match landmarks and edgels to a second case, and unwarp it, and so on. Finally, we average all 14 unwarped cases, now in a considerably more standardized geometry. Comparing this average, on the right, to the one using only landmarks, at the left, shows how the average picture has been sharpened just where we intended to sharpen it along those edges that could be reliably located at the landmarks in most images. Of course, the reason that the edges are better aligned is that we aligned them. But it's remarkable that the cost and complexity of this improvement is so low. And because we are still in a very low dimensional feature space, we can still do endophrenology. We can still compute empirical orthogonal components of sample variation and the like on the warps themselves all the while the averages are sharper for studies of actual pictorial content. Our sample sizes are smaller for comparable statistical power of group discrimination, and so on. This form of analysis can be carried out regionally just as well. In the eight-point digitizing, corpus callosum didn't always line up well with the arch of the average contour. We can add a quasi-landmark in the middle of it, located where the arch is horizontal. Our usual sequence, digitizing and unwarping 14 times, then averaging, yields the picture at the right here, in which, naturally, corpus callosum is sharper than it was before, at no cost to the accuracy of alignments elsewhere. Or, if we were particularly interested in the cerebellum, we might concentrate on this quintet of landmarks, along with three edgels, one bisecting fourth ventricle, one along the border with the brain stem, and one lying along a prominent sulcus at tentorium and again average 14 on warpings. The cerebellum-centered average is on the right. While the cortex is clearly out of register, we have much improved the representation of the cerebellum itself. Of course, we need a great deal more experience with variability in more numerous and more diverse samples. The mathematics we've been exploiting here is not limited to edge rotations only. It applies to any reasonable feature of the derivative of the splined map right at a landmark in two dimensions or three. Here, for instance, are the first frames in a couple of demonstrations of this more general limiting process. Isotropic growth of a tumor right at the center looks like this at the first step of the logarithmic analysis. A process locally doubling length by a factor of two in one direction only proceeds to the limit from a configuration like this. But we're saving these and similar analyses for the next videotape. Typically, image processing works pixel by pixel. The image is treated as a surface lying vertically over its matrix of subscripts. But the technology we've shown you today instead separates the image analysis into two aspects that are conceptually orthogonal. There is a horizontal analysis of these warps, landmark-driven or edgel-driven, with its own visual language, its own averages and biometrics, and then a vertical analysis of the pixels afterwards only in the average geometry. It is sensible to average pixels, compute the variability of edges and gradients, and generally talk about samples of more than one creature at a time, only after one has arranged for all versions of each pixel to be biologically the same as best one can. By contrast with other current methods of deformable templates, in our approach to deformation, these horizontal maneuvers generate a space of linear manipulations exactly as the usual vertical pixel-wise computations do. Warps add and subtract and have group differences and correlations just as we are used to for pixels.
But because the operations that are linear in the horizontal domain are intractably nonlinear in the vertical, true quantitative image analysis, the biometrics of large-scale medical scenes, goes much more easily in this pair of complementary spaces than it could possibly proceed had the pictures not been unwarped first. So we have separated the problem of medical image analysis into two spaces, each susceptible to analysis by linear methods. The spaces are related by ordinary statistical covariances and by regarding each picture as one of these low-parameter thin plate splines of the same standard. This last series of images has attempted to animate this separation by cycling through our 14 warped contours on the right with the unwarped pictures on the left. We believe that analysis of biomedical images by these warping functions or their successors is likely to lie at the foundation of future quantitative approaches to real anatomical and functional variability.